I had the opportunity to meet uh, Dr. Leonard Symes. Uh, I was joking with him last night and saying that several years ago, uh, uh, I heard about him, heard about his work, knew about him and knew about his work uh, in terms of addressing health issues, uh, and figured that he would be an important person to invite to have as a keynote speaker. And so I sent him an email and didn't get a response. Sent him another email and didn't get a response, but I sent it for my private email. And my private email, for those of you who know it, is XGen. And some, sometimes the XGen is picked up by spam and taken to the side. And I assume that that was the case. Uh, well, we also had a mutual friend, uh, Dr. Barbara Krimgo. And Barbara is a person that runs the Kellogg's Health Scholars Program. And I mentioned to her in passing uh, uh, at an activity that I had been trying to get hold of uh, Dr. Symes, and she says, he's a personal friend of mine. And little did I know, she picked up the phone and said, Lynn, return Lovell's email. And from that, he accepted my invitation to actually be the, the keynote speaker and has been uh, at every uh, workshop since then and has been a mentor uh, to some of the health scholars that have been in the program. In fact, the training that takes place here uh, is very unusual for the health scholars, uh, in that it's a very diverse program. Uh, we've taken those scholars who are molecular toxicologists and turned them into community-based participatory researchers. Because we've said, you know, if you're going to do toxicology in the community, then you have to know what the community is like and be able to address the, those questions. And so it is an unusual program, and the, and the scholars, as I said, you will hear from and go from health services research to molecular biology and, it's, and to health communication. And so it's very interesting seeing them sit around the table talk about this issue. But Dr. Symes, Dr. Symes is professor, professor emeritus of epidemiology at the University of Texas, the University, University of California, almost got here, University of California, Berkeley. His major research interest has been in the psychosocial uh, risk factors such as job stress, social support, and poverty. And during this research, he has studied San Francisco bus drivers, Japanese living in Japan, Hawaii and California, British civil servants, and people living in Alameda County, California. Dr. Symes has written over two books, probably more now, and over 130 publications, and has been a visiting professor at numerous institutions, including those in England and Japan. He was elected to the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences and received several honors related to his teaching and research, among them the Lensfield Award for Excellence in Teaching, the J.D. Bruce Award for Distinguished Contributions in Preventive Medicine, and the University of California Distinguished Emeritus Professor Award. Now retired, and I really argue about retirement because I think he speaks more than, now that he's retired than he ever spoke at other places. He's principal of the investigated the Wellness Guide Project in California, which is attempting to empower people in communities using printed materials, television, and community resources. Today, he has the distinct honor of introducing one of his mentees, uh, Dr. Simes. Thanks, Lovell. Only very occasionally in our lifetimes do we have an opportunity to be in the presence of a person <clears throat> who has changed our world, a person who has had a profound impact on our way of thinking and on our way of behaving, or in the current parlance, a person who has changed the paradigm. We have such an opportunity this morning. Professor Sir Michael Marmot is that person. Michael received his MD degree from the University of Sydney in Australia in 1968. In 1975, he received his PhD degree in epidemiology from the School of Public Health at Berkeley. The connections between these two events is something that Michael has heard me say on a previous occasion, but since he didn't object to my telling the story before, I'll tell it again. In 1970, I gave a talk in New Zealand 
about the work we were doing at Berkeley on the social determinants of health. <clears throat> Following my talk, a man came up to me and introduced himself, Dr. Peter Harvey, a professor in the medical school at Sydney. He asked if we were really doing the things in Berkeley that I had been talking about. I assured him that we were. He said that the best student in their medical school, a young man named Michael Marmot, was driving the faculty crazy. While he was the brightest student in the class, he questioned everything. He criticized everything. He wanted more. He really wanted to do the kind of thing I had just described that we were doing at Berkeley. And he said that while they never gave fellowships to students to study abroad, because they didn't come back, they would make an exception in his case <laughs> to get him out of their hair. So they gave him a fellowship, uh, and uh, we accepted him at Berkeley gladly. So that's how I first met Michael. He came to Berkeley with his beautiful and talented wife, Alexi, and then wrote the best doctoral dissertation I had ever seen. And then he went off to London to change our world forever. We all know that social class position is the most important determinant of health, but we have not known what to do about this finding. We'll not be able to eliminate social class from our world next week or next year, but the now classic study that Michael did among British civil servants has changed all that. His work is the most important and profound health research of our time. Michael could then have rested and enjoyed his accomplishment. Instead, he agreed to chair the World Health Commission Committee on the Social Determinants of Health. The Marmot Report, Closing the Gap in a Generation, is now having one of the greatest impacts I have ever seen all over the world. As if that wasn't enough, he led a strategic review dealing with the health inequalities in his own country, Great Britain. The report of this British committee, Fair Society, Healthy Lives, is now published and is already having a tremendous impact as well. He has now also been invited by the regional director of WHO Europe to conduct a European review of health inequalities. In 2000, Michael was knighted by Her Majesty the Queen for services to epidemiology and the understanding of health inequalities. I wondered if I would forever after have to call him Sir Michael, but he's informed me that I may still call him Michael. Michael has also been awarded many other honors, including the prestigious Balzan Prize for Epidemiology, a Hero Award from the CDC, the William Graham Prize for Health Services Research. But in 2009, in spite of the fact that he is an epidemiologist, he was elected as president of the British Medical Association. This, of course, is an amazing achievement but by far the best, and perhaps the most ironic award, is in my view, on June the 13th, 2006, the University of Sydney Medical School awarded Michael an honorary Doctor of Medicine degree. Validation some 40 years after they sent him away to Berkeley. <laughs> While all this was going on, Michael has continued as director of the International Institute for Society and Health at University College London, where in his spare time he is also the Medical Research Council Professor of Epidemiology and Public Health. By any standard, Michael is now the most famous epidemiologist in the world. He's a distinguished scholar and a wonderful humanitarian whose work is having a major impact on the lives of people everywhere. And he's also a very nice person. So it's truly a personal and deeply felt honor to introduce Professor Sir Michael Marmot to you, join me in welcoming him to this podium. I could hear that every morning before breakfast and be very happy. <laughs> Len, thank you. And it's an absolute pleasure to be here. I spoke at a...
I spoke at a, a symposium in Germany that was chaired by the former director of NIH, Dr. Zahuni. And he said, who I'd not met when he was director of NIH, but he said, oh, I knew of your work. We couldn't call it inequalities in health in the US. We had to use the rather bland disparities. Inequalities was a little too inflammatory for the United States. But we talk about inequalities in health. And as I'll say several times, inequalities in health that are judged to be avoided, are judged to be avoidable by reasonable means and are not avoided are unfair, unjust, they're wrong, inequitable. We've heard a lot this morning, we've heard a lot this morning about disparities in health care. Rightly, the United States is concerned with disparities in health care. Those of us from other advanced countries look with some bemusement at the US system, why you would spend so much money on health care and yet not provide access to everybody is beyond the rest of us. Uh, no other advanced country uh, organizes what sportingly passes for a healthcare system that way. But having said that, <clears throat> what I'm going to talk about this morning is not disparities in health care. Press something that says forward. That says forward. The assumption on which my work is based is that health is a measure of how well we're doing as a society, not simply an expression of how, adequate, how adequately we allocate health care. The role of chairing the Commission on Social Determinants of Health has taken me into some very odd places, none odder than Goldman Sachs in New York. And I presented data to the symposium on global markets, and I presented data on inequalities in health across the world, and I said, you did it. All these wankers, bankers sitting in the room <laughs> looked a bit stunned. I said, inequalities in health arise because of our set of social and economic arrangements. And health is a measure of how well we are doing as a society. And the distribution of health across society, these avoidable inequalities in health, tell us something really rather profound about the nature of our society. And the third point is that we should be thinking not only about poor health for the poor, important as that is, but about the social gradient in health. I will show you a slide from the Whitehall study. From the first Whitehall study, this is mortality over 25 years. Men were classified by their grade of employment, the top grade, the administrators, the bottom grade, the office support grades. And you can see this social gradient in health. This is mortality over 25 years. In Whitehall, in British civil servants, we do not have the richest people in society, we do not have the poorest people in society, but we have people in white collar jobs, in stable employment, and what you can see is a social gradient in health. Not just civil servants, this was figure one from my English review of health inequalities. Each of these dots represents a small area of England classified by neighborhood income deprivation. So up here we have the least deprived, the most affluent, and down there the most deprived. The top graph is life expectancy. And what you can see is that people near the top, 
have shorter life expectancy than those at the top. These people near the top are nearly the richest people in England, but they have shorter life expectancy than the ones who are really at the top. And the ones who are in the middle, who are not poor by any meaning of that word, have shorter life expectancy than those near the top. And so on, all the way down. If we compared the fifth centile with the 95th centile, the gap is seven years. As I'll show you in a moment, we can find pockets with much bigger differences than that. But the drama in this slide is not the difference between top and bottom, but the gradient. The bottom graph is disability-free life expectancy. The gradient is steeper. The difference between the 5th and the 95th centile is now not 7 years, but 17 years. And the implications of the gradient are quite profound. Everyone's against poverty. If the problem of inequalities in health was confined to poor health for the poor and reasonable health for everybody else, then we should focus on doing something about poverty. The gradient is about the whole of society. We've got to fix society. And all of these people in England have access to a universal healthcare system free at the point of use. We have data showing remarkable equity in access. We're bad at lots of things in the UK, completely hopeless at soccer, not very good at cricket, but one thing we're good at is equity and access to health care. We have that, but we have this remarkable gradient disability free life expectancy. From the beginning with the Commission on Social Determinants of Health and with the English Review, I was pushed to make the economic case. It was said to me that no government would take us seriously unless we could make the economic case for taking action on inequalities in health. I resisted that argument. Let me give you an example of what we might do if we took the economic argument. The implication of th this difference between life expectancy and disability, free life expectancy, is people at the top live 12 years on average with disability and people at the bottom live 20 years on average with disability. How could we reduce that? Hand out free cigarettes to the poor. It's cheap, it's cost effective, save money. You don't look very excited by that idea. Of course you're not excited by that idea. It's morally corrupt. We don't do things just because they're cheap and effective. We do what's right. It's morally unacceptable simply to pursue the cost-effective option. I would argue that avoidable health inequalities are a stain on a civilized society and not to take the not to take the action necessary to reduce these avoidable health inequalities is morally wrong. The argument is an ethical one, not an economic one. But in case government is not convinced by that, I drew on the graph this horizontal line. In Britain, we have mandatory retirement age at 65 for men, 60 for women, although that will be equalized. The previous government had planned to increase the pension age to 68 by 2046. The present government has indicated it wants to do that more quickly. Were pension age, retirement age, 68 today, the implication is that about three quarters of the population do not have disability free life expectancy as long as 68. If the implication of having disability meant that you were on disability benefits, on welfare, prolonging 
working age to 68 would have the effect of moving people off pensions onto disability benefits, which would save no money and be a dubious social advance. You have to deal with the social gradient in health, otherwise economic policy will run into the buffers. This is not just an English problem. I can't resist showing you this, although it's slightly irrelevant to my talk. But this is the social gradient, for example, in heart disease in England and in the United States. We did a comparison between the health and retirement study and the English longitudinal study of aging of men and women 55 to 64. And we confined it to white men and women uh, because we've got the cross-national comparison. And you can see that the Americans have more illness than the English while having a very similar social gradient. A journalist for the Financial Times says he now uses this as a case study that good news gets much less widely reported than bad news. That when we published this, it, there was a mild glimmer of interest in the British press that we were doing well. There was an enormous outpouring of interest in the US press. This was on the evening news two weeks after we published it. It went on and on and on. The Americans had lost the health wars to the English. 92% <laughs> of people in the American sample had access to health insurance. Everybody in the top two turtiles of income had health insurance. This was not a lack of health care issue. I argued that it was related to the social determinants of health, which seemed to be operating more adversely in the US than they were in England. I talk about social gradients. People then ask me, are you then only concerned with relative differences? Is this all about jealousy? Because if it's all about jealousy, and it's all about relative differences, won't we always have relative differences in society? And I quote Nobel laureate Amartya Sen, who says relative differences, he uses the word space, but the dimension of incomes can yield absolute deprivation in the space of capabilities. In other words, it's not what you have, but what you can do with what you have. Yes, relative differences in income might be important, but they're important insofar as they relate to what you can do. In Sen's language, <coughs> measured by capabilities. It was with this research in mind, and maybe it was a sign of my aging or whatever, that uh, I agreed to chair the WHO Commission on Social Determinants of Health. We launched it in Santiago de Chile in March 2005. President Lagos of Chile hosted the meeting and subsequently became a member of the commission. Uh, Jong Wook Lee, J.W. Lee, who was then Director General of WHO, this person with the idiot smile on his face is me. Um, and J.W. Lee said, the goal is not an academic exercise, but to marshal scientific evidence as a lever for policy change, aiming towards practical uptake among policymakers and stakeholders in countries. And we published our report in August 2008. We called it Closing the Gap in a Generation. as I'll show you in just a moment, we're dealing with a more than 40 year difference in life expectancy across the world. And we called our report, Closing the Gap in a Generation. Are we nuts? We've we gone bananas? It was a statement that we have the knowledge to close the gap in a generation. We have the means to close the gap in a generation. 
The question is, do we have the will? And we said, consistent with what I've been saying to you so far this morning, that doing it, taking the action, was a matter of social justice. We put empowerment at the heart of what we were trying to achieve, and we saw empowerment as having a material dimension, having enough money to live on, shelter, food, a psychosocial dimension, having control over your lives, and political, having voice. And that could apply to individuals, to communities, and indeed to whole countries. These were the kind of findings that gave rise to setting up the Commission on Social Determinants of Health. This is life expectancy for men under 40 in Sierra Leone, 80 in Iceland. For women, life expectancy in Zimbabwe and Afghanistan are 42, in Japan, 86. And our starting position is there's no good biological reason why there should be a 44-year difference in life expectancy across the world. And this huge problem of inequalities in health is not confined to these big differences between countries. When we published the report of the Commission, I highlighted the Scottish city of Glasgow. Life expectancy for men in the poorest part of Glasgow is 54. In the richest part, it's 82. Just to remind you, we have universal access to health care free at the point of use regardless of ability to pay. Life expectancy for the poorest men in Glasgow is eight years shorter than the average in India at 62. In India, 75% of the population live on $2 a day or less. No one in Glasgow lives on $2 a day or less. In Glasgow, they don't, they don't die of malaria. You turn on the faucet, the water's safe to drink. The food's disgusting, but it doesn't kill you in the short term. <laughs> in Glasgow, they don't die of communicable disease. They die of heart disease and stroke and cancer and violent deaths and other alcohol-related deaths. They die, in other words, of the same things we die of in the rest of the United Kingdom, but at a faster rate. So we have this huge problem of potentially avoidable inequalities within countries and between countries. When I published a book in 2004, I used the example of the Washington Metro. It said, catch the Metro from suburban Maryland to downtown Washington, D.C., and life expectancy drops a year and a half for every mile traveled, a 20-year gap in life expectancy. This is not grounds for depression. Things can change really quickly. I've been going around the world saying I'm an evidence-based optimist. Uh, and here's some of the evidence on which my optimism is based. Look, for example, at Vietnam and Zambia. In the 1950s, 1960s, we might have said these countries have very poor health, very low life expectancy, because they live in great poverty. What could we do about it? Well, look what happened. In Zambia, it plateaued, and then life ex expectancy fell. In Vietnam, once that minor disturbance in their country was over, uh, <laughs> life expectancy improved dramatically. Costa Rica has always been one of the famous examples of a relatively poor country with remarkably good health that continues to improve. Life expectancy in Costa Rica, for men in Costa Rica, is now identical to that of men in the United States, at about one-third the national income at purchasing power parities. 
I was in Costa Rica last year at the invitation of the Pan American Health Organization, and I said, how did you do this? I mean, what has this been about? And they said, the first thing they said was, in 1948, we abolished the military. <laughs> Our spending on military is a round number, zero. Why do you want to have the military, they said. Most countries use their troops to suppress their own citizens. We thought education, health care, empowerment of women, social protection, clean water was a better way to deal with our citizens. They have their problems, like every other country, but remarkably good health. It was put to me that the gradient that's been the center of my research activities and now my focus on policy and practice is an effete concern of rich countries. Colleagues working in sub-Saharan Africa said, we surely should be concerned with the poorest of the poor. This is under five mortality children by quintiles, wealth quintiles, in Uganda. The middle quintile in Uganda have higher under five mortality than the bottom quintile in India. If you focused only on the poorest, let's say the bottom 20%, you miss the fact that under five mortality for the middle quintile is unacceptably high. It's 160 per thousand live births. The average for high income countries is seven. And in India, the second top quintile, as in every other country, has higher under five mortality than the top. Surely the aim should be to get everybody to the level of the best and then improve the best. There's Peru. It's not quite down to seven, but for the best, but it's getting there. So the gradient is very widespread. And again, the implications are profound. It means taking action across the whole of society. In the final report of the Commission, we said the unequal distribution of health damaging experiences is not in any sense a natural phenomenon, but is the result of a toxic combination of poor social policies and programs, unfair economic arrangements, and bad politics. I thought we shouldn't come on too strong in the WHO report. We said social injustice is killing on a grand scale. And that means, to put it right, we've got to do something about social injustice. But we wanted to give the evidence-based actions that would underpin this approach to social justice. And we had three principles of action. The conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age. The structural drivers of those conditions at global, national, and local level. And the importance of monitoring, training, and research. And in the conditions of daily life, we had recommendations on early child development and education healthy places, fair employment, social protection, and universal health care. It's not that we think health care is unimportant, it's vital. But it's one amongst many that require action. And in the structural drivers, health equity in all policies, good global governance, gender equity, political empowerment, market responsibility, and fair financing. I was in a meeting in Norway last year, and the Minister of Foreign Affairs said, I am a health minister. Every minister is a health minister. And I would say every sector is a health sector. What happens across the whole of society, as you said in your introduction, sir, uh, is absolutely vital. And I met Howard Cove. Uh, in Washington a few weeks ago, who emphasized exactly what you said. 
how absolutely crucial it is to take action across all the key sectors of society, not only the healthcare sector. One of the big questions when you do a commission report, and we spent three and a half years on that commission, is will anybody listen? Is anybody out there taking it seriously? I never thought I would reach a stage of my life when I thought that a resolution at the World Health Assembly was important. God help me. But there was a resolution at the World Health Assembly in 2009 38 member states spoke up, despite my saying social injustice is killing on a grand scale. They supported the report and its recommendations unequivocally and in call, called on in the resolution all member states to tackle health inequities through action on the social determinants of health. There will, in October this year, be a global... Am I interfering with him? <laughs> uh, there will, in October this year, be a global summit in Rio de Janeiro on social determinants of health, hosted by the President of Brazil and organized by the World Health Organization. So th there's a lot that's going on. The report of the Commission was endorsed by the Director General, Margaret Chan. Much of the blame for the essentially unfair way our world works rests at the policy level, she said. One of the issues you do a Commission like this, where the reach is global, is how do you get a set of recommendations that would apply equally to Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, North America, Houston, Texas, Glasgow. We tried to make a virtue of necessity and said that it was vital that our recommendations be translated into different country contexts. Brazil set up its own Commission on Social Determinants of Health, President Lula holding the report of the Brazilian Commission. I had the honor to hand a copy of our report to the Indian Prime Minister, Manmohan Singh. Dr. Singh asked, what would you like me to do? He's the Prime Minister of one billion people, and he's asked, what would I like him to do? <laughs> With respect, I said that life expectancy for women in India had improved by 13 years in only 30 years. Just think what that means. 13 years in only 30 years. Divide by 10, that's 1.3 years every three years. That's about nine hours a day. Every 24 hours, life expectancy improved another nine hours. That's a wonderful achievement. Whatever India is doing, has really been going in the right direction. But life expectancy for women in Japan is 86. Got another 23 years to go. Why would you imagine that there's any necessary reason why life expectancy for women in India should not be the same as in Japan? And were he minded to take the report of the commission and see how it could be applied in the Indian context, I ventured to suggest it would make a big difference. And there's a huge amount of activity going on in India, but a very complex country. The president of Sri Lanka accepted a copy of our report. Sri Lanka expressed its willingness to take action. Uh, what I had in mind was not killing Tamils, but I'm hopeful that things will now happen. And the president of Costa Rica said she wanted to make this a priority for her presidency. And she signaled her intention to be at the Global Summit in Rio this year. And in my own country, in the wake of the Global Commission, I was asked to conduct this review of health inequalities in England. 
and we've got the European review that Dr. Sain mentioned. I gave my English review the title, Fair Society, Healthy Lives, because it was a statement that if you put fairness at the heart of all decision making, health would improve and health inequalities would diminish. I said in a different context that I'm slightly regretful that we gave it that title because the new coalition government in Britain is banding the word fairness about as if it has no meaning at all. They've increased consumption tax, value-added tax, which is regressive, and they call it fair. They've cut benefits to the poor, and they call it fair. They let the bankers get away with blue murder, and they call it fair. It's a parody of fairness. I've been asked, what's the one thing that you would say to the Prime Minister or the President? I said, one thing? I'm only allowed one thing? <laughs> Read my report. Okay. If I'm allowed one more thing, put fairness at the heart of all policy making. If you can't decide which is the right economic model, a stimulus versus a deficit cutting model, put fairness at the heart. If the economists can't agree which is the right model, then look at the impact on the lives people are able to lead. And one way of assessing that is by the likely impact on the distribution of health. The context matters. Let me take you through this. I'm going to talk about the British data here mainly because it was an English review, but you can decide whether this applies to the United States. This solid green line is the share of total household income enjoyed by the top 20% of earners. So in 1977, the top 20% had about 37% of total household income. We then climbed this steep cliff so that the share of total household income enjoyed by the top 20% went up to about 42 or 43% and stayed there. That was Margaret Thatcher as Prime Minister, John Major, Tony Blair, Gordon Brown. Didn't make any difference. This is the bottom 20%. Started at around 9% of total household income, went down to 6%, and stayed there. Now, if you think that's the bad news, look at the dotted line. The dotted line is post-tax. The solid line is pre-tax, is gross income plus benefits. The dotted line is post-tax. I'm a simple doctor. What do I know? If you'd asked me did we have a progressive taxation system in our country? I would have said yes, of course. The rich pay a higher proportion of their income in tax than the poor. That's not true. We don't. We have a proportionate taxation system, not a progressive one. In other words, it's a flat tax. Because the consumption tax is regressive and the mildly progressive nature of income tax is more than balanced by the regressive nature of sales tax, of consumption tax. In fact, we put in our report the top 20% of earners pay 35% of their income in tax and the bottom 20% pay 38%. I think that's unfair. I think if you put fairness at the heart of all decision making, you wouldn't do that. You wouldn't do that in the United States. <laughs> this is what's happened to household income in the US from 1970 to 2005. And the median, the 50th centile, has more or less not shifted for 35 years. 
the 95th centile has gone up very nicely, thank you. 90th, the 80th, but the median has hardly changed. Let's break that down a bit. This is the share of total household income enjoyed by the top 1%. In 1929, the top 1% of earners had 23% of total household income. You remember what happened next? Whew. And the share of the top 1% went down to under 10% where it still was in 1978 and then it climbed remarkably by 2007 the top 1% had 23% of total household income and do you remember what happened next? Now I'm a serious academic correlation is not causation far be it from me to suggest there's a causal connection between the greed of the top 1% and the fact that the rest of us suffered because of that greed. Who benefits? Who benefits in society from that egregious share of total wealth enjoyed by the top 1%? I can tell you what's going on in Britain, and I'm surprised, I would be surprised if it was any different in the United States. What's going on in Britain is public sector workers earning less than the median income, have had their pay frozen. And now they're having their public sector pensions cut because of the greed of the top 1%. Is that fair? Is that a way we want to organize our affairs in society? In the English Review, which is now known as the Marmot Review, we had six areas of recommendations. Give every child the best start in life, education, fair employment and good work for all, healthy standard of living for all, create and develop healthy and sustainable places and communities, and strengthen the role and impact of ill health prevention. And I want to finish with just showing you a little bit of the evidence. So let's look at give every child the best start in life. This has now become known in policy circles in Britain as that graph. Children was followed from 22 months of age to 10 years of age in the 1970 British birth cohort. These are scores on cognitive development relative measure. Look at the children who were in the 10th centile of cognitive development at 22 months. If they grew up in families of low socioeconomic status, they remain low. There's regression to the mean, but that needn't detain us now. If they grew up in families of high socioeconomic status, they catch up. Look at the children who at 22 months were at the 90th centile on cognitive development. If they grew up in families of high socioeconomic status, they remain high. If they grew up in families of low socioeconomic status, their relative position declines. To put it bluntly, if you're dumb and poor, you stay dumb, but if you're dumb and rich, you're okay. If you're smart and rich, you stay okay, but if you're smart and poor, bad luck, because you don't stay that way. Assume for a moment that all the differences in cognitive development at 22 months were biologically determined. Genes, nutrition in pregnancy, outcome of pregnancy. What happens after 22 months is more important than what happened in the first 22 months. The social trumps the biological. Now, of course, not all the differences at 22 months are biological. The quality of early nurturing is vital. 
parenting, nutrition in the first 22 months all make a huge difference. Now, why am I showing you this? We're talking about inequalities in health. Because what happens at the beginning of life determines what happens to these children in the education system. That, in turn, will determine whether they get a job at all or what sort of job they get and the income and where they live. And that, in turn, will have a profound impact on health and well-being and, hence, on inequalities in health. And you can see school readiness at ages three and five, the social gradient by income quintile. This is school readiness at three, vocabulary at three, vocabulary at five. Are you getting the message about the social gradient? This is not simply the poorest of the poor. It's a graded phenomenon. And conduct problems goes the other way. Can we do anything about this? Data from Canada show that children from low income have low scores on readiness for school. Half the deficit in readiness for school associated with low income can be reversed by reading to children daily. Look at the social gradient in reading to children daily. It was put to me that we would be reporting into an adverse economic climate. Here's a really expensive intervention. Read to your children. I was talking to a group of chief executives from local government and from primary care trusts in one region. There were 26 of each in the room. And I showed them this. And one chief executive from local government leapt to her feet and said, we should implement this this afternoon. What are we waiting for? Indeed, what are we waiting for? Create fair employment and good work for all. We have this measure in Britain, not in employment, education or training. And you can see that about uh, of 16 to 18 year olds uh, at the end of 2009, uh, just under 10% of 16 to 18 year olds were not in education, employment or training. But if we look just at employment, the current economic downturn has selectively affected young people. The unemployment amongst young people is particularly high. You can see for 16 to 17 year olds, at the beginning of 2011, unemployment was 37.7%. That means that education and training schemes for young people are public health measures. It was put to me that in previous economic downturns, young people leaving school who didn't get into work, into the labor market when they left school, never got into the labor market. In the more deprived areas of Britain, we're looking at two generations of workless households, if not three generations of workless households. Does this speak to you? Indeed it does. And the quality of work is important. Ensure a healthy standard of living for all. What a remarkable idea. In a rich society, Everybody should have the minimum necessary for a healthy life. We showed how you could calculate that. Professor Jerry Morris, after his 90th birthday, published papers on minimum income for healthy living. And for example, when he was looking at people on welfare, on old age pensions, he said, it's not just food and shelter, you need to have enough money to buy presents for your grandchildren. How could you live a life of dignity if you haven't got sufficient to buy presents for your grandchildren? That's part of the minimum income necessary for a healthy life. 
So it's more than foods, clothes, and shelter, but sufficient resources to participate in society and to maintain human dignity. We said that the environmental agenda and the social determinants of health agenda should be brought together. And we showed how you could do this in looking at healthy and sustainable places. And let me show you one example. And I'll just take you through this. This is deaths from circulatory disease in England. And people were classified in two ways. By income group, income group four is the most deprived, so income group one is the top income group, and by exposure to green space. So look first at the group with least exposure to green space. And these are relative differences. One is the relative mortality of the top income group. The second from the top income group has a relative mortality of 1.3. The third income group, 1.7. And the bottom, 2.2. So these are, this is the social gradient relative differences. Look at the group with middle level exposure to green space. There's a social gradient, but it's shallower. Look at the group with most exposure to green space. The social gradient is shallower still. Now, of course, in Britain, the higher your income, the more likely you are to have exposure to green space. But if we took the steps to make exposure to green space more equitable, we could reduce the social gradient in mortality from heart disease. We also show that there's improvement in mental health by exposure to green space. We put in the English report that the money spent on road improvement over a four-year period, had it been diverted, could have led to the building of 1,000 new urban parks, two in every local area. Good for the green agenda, good for health inequities. And strengthen the role and impact of ill health prevention. We pointed out that only 4% of National Health Service funding is spent on prevention. We said in our report it should be 7%. I can't for the life of me remember how we got to 7%. The best I can do is doubling it sounds a bit arbitrary, whereas 7% sounds a bit scientific. Um, we tried to make all our recommendations based on the best evidence, but this one escapes me slightly. But I'm sure it ought to be more than it is. And we said, coming back to what I said at the beginning, that action should be across the whole of government across the whole of society, and it's important to act at a local level as well as at a national level. We ought to proceed on the assumption that health inequalities are not inevitable or immutable. I showed you the example of Glasgow. The chief medical officer for Glasgow, a colleague, Harry Burns, actually now Sir Harry Burns, he was knighted a few weeks ago, <coughs> compared mortality in Glasgow with Liverpool and Manchester. These are three post-industrial cities. Think Detroit, think Cleveland, hollowed out post-industrial cities. And they have similar levels of income inequality, but mortality is higher in Glasgow than in Liverpool and Manchester. Look at the four causes of death that make the biggest contribution to the relative excess in Glasgow compared with Liverpool and Manchester. Drug-related poisonings, alcohol, suicide, and external causes, violent deaths. And then lung cancer, which is behavioral, it's smoking. In other words, these four causes of death plus lung cancer are psychosocially determined. A major element of the excess risk of premature death seen in Scotland is psychosocially determined. Harry Burns points to study evidence of low sense of control, low self-efficacy and self-esteem in population in these areas. Taking action on social determinants of health 
should be addressing the lives people are able to lead. We think people having control over their lives is fundamental. <clears throat> and you really can make a difference. When people ask me, don't we always have inequities in society? If health follows from social inequities, won't we always have social inequalities in health? And the answer is yes, probably, but the magnitude varies. These are two regions of England, the southwest here and the northeast, and mortality by the government's socioeconomic classification. If you're the top socioeconomic group, higher managerial and professional, it doesn't matter where in the country you live. Mortality is low. The lower you are in the social hierarchy, the more it matters where you live. The greater the disadvantage of living in the northeast, in the hollowed out post-industrial areas. So the gradient's steeper in the northeast than the southwest. If we can get that much difference in the gradient at one point in time, it ought to be possible to flatten the gradient of the northeast towards the southwest. And my colleagues who work in the southwest say they think the inequities they have are unacceptably high. They want to get it down further. I think we know how to do it. I think we have the evidence which, if put into practice, would make a huge contribution to reducing the avoidable inequalities in health within and between countries. And I think, in the end, what we want to do is to create the conditions in which individuals and communities have control over their lives and participate fully in society.